Hey guys, and welcome back. This is Autofocus, and I'm Steven Streeter. Today, we're going to take a look at the Netflix film You People and how the creators came so close to making a powerful film, but missed it by that much. You People is a comedic gamble through what it's like in an interracial relationship and the many pitfalls that follow when involving family. It's not merely a tale of a white family confronted by the possibility of their daughter marrying a black man or vice versa, all I guess who's coming to dinner, but rather the tension is on a whole new level when you consider the characters at the table. 35-year-old Ezra Cohen, played by Jonah Hill, is having a tough time finding love within a partner who sees him for who he truly is. Or as he puts it, I feel like Beavis Drake. I feel like I'm alone on a building in Toronto dangling my legs off, wondering what it's like to feel companionship. That's the space I'm in. Well, I need you to dig deep down in that little Jewish body of yours and pull out CLB Drake, okay? Certified lover boy energy all through here. I don't have certified lover boy energy, Drake energy right now. I just don't. I'm, I'm literally, I'm literally take care, Drake. In between working a boring finance job, he hosts a podcast with his best friend, Mo, that covers a variety of topics that more often than not revolve around black culture. When he meets costume designer Amira, played by Lauren London, sparks fly, and they quickly begin a relationship, fall in love, support each other's dreams, and eventually move in together. Amira is a black Muslim who grew up in the new gentrified Baldwin Park, and Ezra is a Jewish guy from Brentwood. In love and hoping to get married, they come face to face with a harsh reality, that though their cultural differences may have seemed small at first, they quickly discover that those differences were not simply surface tension, but rather deeply rooted in opposing culture, politics, and religion. Amira's mother Fatima, played by Nia Long, and father Akbar, played by Eddie Murphy, are prematurely biased and certain that Ezra's white Jewish background and personality are a poor match for their daughter Amira. While Ezra's parents Shelley and Arnold, played by Julia Louise Dreyfus and David Duchovny, are bogged down in I'm Not Racist theatrics that end up being absurd, ridiculous, and ultimately offensive to Amira, her family, and the viewing audience. And when their parents meet and are confronted by the obvious social ignorance Shelley and Arnold are afflicted with versus Akbar and Fatima's suspicions, well, the pain is only amplified to a tipping point of hostility with Ezra and Amir's relationship caught in the balance. These scenes don't feel written or directed, merely suggested, like an improv show out of control, i.e. SNL in long form. Every transition introduces another scenario where two characters suffer a forced misunderstanding that leads to awkward riffing until the scene arbitrarily ends. But I am going to give it everything I have. You're gonna give it everything you've got? That sounds like some white boy shit. I'm gonna give it everything I've got. I don't do impressions. I don't think, I don't even, I don't th think you do impressions. This approach is applied to all kinds of moments. When a member of the Cohen synagogue asks Ezra about his penis. When Ezra's father babbles on about how much he loves Exhibit. When his mother makes uncomfortably performative attempts to be inclusive. Did you not just see what happened? Oh, what just happened? Okay. Just so you know, I come here all the time. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so then I come in here with you. Mm -hmm. And they let some white woman just go in front of us. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't. Or the many, many times Ezra pretends he is knowledgeable about black culture. Our guy, the legend, Malcolm X. Love Farrakhan. I'm chilling. This place is dope. And Amir's father, Akbar, calls him out on it. Langston Hughes Park, you mentioned that you play there all the time. Although a pretty extensive Google search, and literally every single person I asked about it never heard of it. Hey, can my man play? Yeah, come on, let's go, come on. You got next. Hurry up. All right, yeah. This okay. film catches you off guard as it drags you through scene on top of scene, one after the other in unrealistic, concocted race-baiting theatrics smothered in forced racial conflict and the nonsensical characterizations of these people. The portrayal of a white family, so unaware of their biases they come off racist out of ignorance, coupled with a black family waiting to be offended by the clueless whites make for a predictable and tactless plot. This is supposed to be a comedy, and predictability is an enemy to comedians. What if Ezra's parents, rather than putting off the I'm not racist charade, actually accepted Amira for who she is, with race having nothing to do with it, putting Ezra in his place, on the spot, 
for preparing Amira to meet his out of touch and most likely ignorant and racist parents, turning the tables on expectation and opening the story up to less racially charged hijinks. But of course, that is not as easy as building off the already supercharged assumptions in society and feeding into the racial rhetoric with some triggering fun and games, right? Anyway, after the barrage of charged interactions Ezra and Amira experience, instead of clashing and misunderstanding and arrogance, they could have come together in an understanding and empathetic way after experiencing the predicted difficulties they would face. Everyone knows that meeting the family of your potential spouse is scary and uncomfortable, filled with awkward and embarrassing situations. These difficulties are only magnified exponentially when the cultural backgrounds and political hyperboles are as divergent as that of a white Jew and a black Muslim coming together in such a provocative way. So the loopholes and bumps in the road were expected. Awkward and embarrassing, yes, but expected. So when Ezra and Amira allow these predictable conflicts to come between them, instead of trudging through the sludge and finding a way through, it becomes all too obvious that what you thought could have been a commentary on today's ridiculous political atmosphere was in fact a formulaic, predictable rom-com. Two people with relationship problems that come together in an unexpected meet-cute, but eventually find themselves at odds, break up, and after a grand gesture, live happily ever after. But being a rom-com doesn't provide an excuse to trudge up such triggering content without providing a thought-out resolution. Instead, there is simply an about-face in mockery with an obtuse coming together that feels just as forced as the barrage of racial inequities proliferating this film. When focusing on the subjects of race, racism, and interracial relationships, it's important to have a fully fleshed out concept addressing the issues in their complexities head on. Otherwise, the story falls flat and feels like the writers only scratched the surface without really providing true unbiased perspective of the issues. Issues that are usually displayed in a portrait of black and white, deprived of the possibility for any altruistic beliefs that might exist. Of course, any challenges to a person's baseline assumptions about life and the world, regardless of how well-meaning a person can be, is going to be disorienting and uncomfortable, and missteps will be made. The conflict lies in the intentions behind a behavior, intentions clouded over by the preconceived assumptions that stonewall any opportunity for understanding and merely feed the seeds of conflict. A missed opportunity as the film drags you through the trenches of racial murkiness and skips the needed work to heal the self-inflicted wounds from personal assumptions and suspicions. Netflix's You People is either a horrible representation of the racism embedded in society, or it is a clever and intrinsic tale falling just short of exquisite profundity. Then there's this. Hi. I mean, hey. Okay. <laughs> Pull over. <laughs> <laughs> she's spoken for. Uh, uh, Liza's gay, she's queer, she's lesbian. And there you have it, a token homosexual represented in this film for a total of 30 seconds, give or take. Never to be seen again in the film in any form of representation at all. And this is how she's pointed out. LGBTQ. You got it all, which we love yes. and accept because that is our vibe. That's how we roll. <laughs> this moment of satirical representation stuck with me. It made me keep coming back to this movie. It's the intentions behind the behavior. It seems too easy to brush it off as a critical race theory propaganda style narrative. Could it be that the blatant overbearing display of racial animosities that are overcome so easily are actually a jab at the ridiculous nature of the grudges rooted in the sins of our fathers that can just as easily be cleansed from our society's narrative? In the same way that this forced token of inclusivity was slid in with sarcastic undertones, expressing the exhaustion felt by viewers uninterested in inclusivity for the sake of inclusivity, being forced on films by their producers and distributors, so too can the acknowledgement of the damaging nature that pushing racial differences through education and entertainment expresses the exhaustion of the preconceived biases and suspicions of bigotry that play out in our lives. Well. That's all folks, it's been informative. If this content has been helpful or absurd, let me know what you think in the comments below. All opinions are welcome here. And don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you never miss an autofocus journey. Until next time, I'm Steven Streeter, catch ya on the flip side. How about that?